Oh, so we are now live. And so the attendees are going to start coming in. Um, welcome, everybody. We'll just give it a few moments for people to join. Um, uh, before we start off the session, uh, because you know, not everybody is as on time as you first attendees are. It's lovely to have you all. I can see some familiar names in there. Um, perfect. All right. So I can, I see we're spanning all continents again in our attendees as well as in our panelists. So let's get today's session started then. Um, so it's my pleasure to start this open conversation today um, about urban hyperlocal supply chains um, with Meva and Felipe. Um, so I'll briefly introduce Meva before handing over to her. So uh, Meva is the project engineer at White Linus Technologies and the Thought for Food Regional Coordinator for Europe. Um, she has completed her PhD studies in engineering sciences and during her stu studies she researched and published papers on urban parametric design and green infrastructure planning. So she is the ideal person to lead today's discussion. Um, so Maeva, please open to you, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for the presentation. I'm really excited to have this open conversation with the TFF community and with our amazing panelists. So today's conversation is about um, engaging discussions on the topic of urban hyperlocal supply chains. Um, so more specifically, I would like to talk about urban agriculture initiatives and how current context of COVID-19 uh, is influencing uh, this uh, urban agriculture sector. So where are the opportunities, where are the constraints and how business are adapting to to this new um, So I'm co-hosting this session with uh, Felipe, uh, Felipe Hernandez, who is based in Milano. Uh, I'm based in Amsterdam, by the way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Felipe, could you please maybe introduce yourself? Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure for me to talk about my primary activity in Hexagro. As you know, I'm the lead product, lead product development and founder, and also um, to talk here as an ambassador of Thought for Food organization in Milan. So um, first of all, I would like to uh, share with you uh, a little bit of my own experience um, regarding uh, my entrepreneurial activity uh, as a startup uh, in this sector of urban farming how has this crisis affected us, and of course, how we plan to adapt uh, to this crisis. So um, first of all, uh, I would like to share my screen to show you more or less what we're talking about. Hexagro is an indoor farming platform to accelerate the accessibility to indoor farming technologies. And basically, we would like to allow anybody anywhere to access healthy food by reconnecting to nature through farming. And uh, the way we're doing this is uh, by developing very aesthetic, stylish uh, farming systems that work with the state of art technology of these indoor farming and vertical farming industries that can actually be part of our daily lives. So um, before all of this crisis, we were um, focusing on bringing these gardens to companies that could allow us to offer an experience, a well-being tool that could actually offer the value of uh, greenery decoration, but also data collection and uh, fresh food on site. And therefore, um, we were uh, initializing to commercialize these systems in semi-public spaces like offices, hotels, until, of course, um, this happened. So it was completely disruptive for us. Uh, we had to uh, stop all of our activities uh, in our customer sites. Uh, the customers that we had in the pipeline are now facing financial issues. And as you know, here in Milan, we are uh, in the second epicenter of the virus. So it really hit us hard. Uh, we had to close 
our laboratories for two months. Uh, we had to keep, uh, of course, our team working from home. But uh, apart from all the disgrace, let's say, um, that this, this crisis represents, we are noticing a very big opportunity for our sector because um, health systems and food systems are what is what are keeping this society you know um, on on float and uh, we are seeing how our sector is just accelerating because of this crisis as many other sectors are doing so um we have focused in these months of lock, lockdown where, that gave us the opportunity also to re-strategize our business, to give the opportunity to, our, um, to the people in cities to grow food and actually be able to uh, look for their own little independence. Um, we were um, developing a project, a social project in Colombia, aiming to provide uh, more simple systems to uh, farmers and uh, consumers. And uh, as a strategy uh, for this, we are now uh, launching this product, which is called Poti, which basically allows you to grow in balconies and in existing spaces, a high yield of produce, uh, with an automated, very simple system that can actually allow you to, to harvest a lot of uh, produce. This was in the beginning aimed for social projects um, in Colombia specifically, my country of origin, uh, which have no access to this kind of technologies. So um, we did this uh, uh, launch as a kind of reaction to the market uh, requests and also to, to cover a need. So what we plan to do with our core product, the one that we are starting commercialize, to commercialize, is to bring it to the, to the people where they live and provide uh, the value of having um, decorative element, for example, as you can see in this image, in a, in a lobby of a residence. It could be perfectly fit into a living room and uh, try to, to bring this possibility directly to our um, audience. And not only this, it's also about empowering uh, farmers. And the way we are doing this is by transferring the technology to high yield, low cost systems that can actually make this uh, high yield uh, technology available. So not our clients are not only going to be able to grow food for themselves, but empower farmers uh, in the other side of the world. And I think that in these times, um, having a very strong social purpose, having a, a, a really um, a strong um, you know, sense of improvement for sustainability using concepts of circular economy and, and uh, local production are the key for, for future success. So um, what we really want to achieve and uh, has been accelerated with this crisis is our vision of a decentralized food system in, in which we will try to tackle uh, these kind of problems with the traditional supply chain of food by creating um, hyper-local uh, food production centers in which you will have, for example, consumer clients connected with corporate clients connected with farmers that together can uh, cooperate and act as if they were um, a natural system. So uh, this is pretty much what we do in Hexagro, and this is how we're trying to adapt to the current uh, situation. Uh, it's very unclear uh, so far for a lot of people, but we are noticing that uh, there might be a lot of problems, but also a lot of opportunities. Cool, very cool projects. Uh, I really like the, the fact that you're changing your business model. So uh, originally you were saying you were focusing on hotels and now you're trying to, to focus more on households. And uh, it's true that consumers now more than ever are more health conscious because it's a, it's a health crisis, right? We don't take our health for granted anymore, especially that the virus is affecting more people with uh, obesity problem or diabetes. 
So it's totally relevant that uh, bio supermarkets are more successful or this kind of initiative that you are showing is have, have much more success. Um, my question would be now, um, do you see in this current context that um, there's more openings from other partners? Because you're not the only business in this situation, right? There are other businesses that are looking for new solutions, uh, new collaboration opportunities. Um, do you already feel that it's the time for innovation and collaboration, basically? Well, I think uh, this is the time for urban agriculture. I have never felt so confident about this as now. And I can see this just by looking at other industries. Look at 3D printing industry. It has yeah. grown uh, so much because of this crisis, because the consumer choice and the consumer behavior are changing. Now we are appreciating new ways of benefit because of self-sufficiency. So auto production is going to be a trend of the future from now on. So yes, there has been a change in the industry of home garden equipment, let's say. We know about uh, companies in the sector, which I won't mention, but uh, some of them are going to have completely run out of stock. They have actually had problems to, to cover the demand. And we are also seeing a trend of uh, people wanting to grow more than these kind of little systems allow them to. So there is really um, a new awareness, a new sense of awareness for using technology to produce food uh, locally. And I think that this kind of uh, technologies can increase our food uh, independence. I'm not saying it's going to be the sole solution for a resilient food system. I, I'm saying that it might be part of, of, a, of a solution as we did in the past uh, where when everybody grew their own little things in their garden and they were sharing them among a community. I, am, I strongly believe that this can happen again with the use of technology. Yeah, exactly. Especially like yesterday, I was reading an article about um, food shortages during uh, the Second World War and uh, in Rotterdam, because now I moved to Netherlands, so really interested in looking at uh, the history of the Netherlands. And I was seeing that uh, in Rotterdam, um, there were like really high risk of food shortages and it actually happened. And people were um, increasingly um, growing food in their backyards and urban agriculture initiatives were exploding. But at the end of the war, um, there was actually not really an organization who was responsible for all these urban farms, or they were not like a coordinated um, movement for that. So, so people, everything went back to normal and um, yeah, food were produced again um, on the countryside. And it would be interesting to see how we could also in the post COVID-19 um, context, how we're gonna go on with this urban agriculture that is all about health, also mental and physical health. It's really important to, to keep this, uh, this knowledge inside the city. Um, I have another question. Uh, so you started Exago uh, how long ago, how many years ago? Well, actually this started, it started as a bachelor project as a ah, okay. project uh, around six years ago. And when I moved uh, to Italy to study my master's degree, I had the opportunity to present it in a graduation. Um, a former Nobel Prize winner uh, was there. I don't know why. What? Really? <laughs> His name is <laughs> Professor Musan, Muhan Munasinghe. Okay. And he's uh, from Sri Lanka. He, wore, he won uh, together with Al Gore, uh, the, the Nobel Prize, and he came to me and said, uh, Felipe, this project is great. I really believe that you are doing something uh, that can benefit uh, society, keep it ongoing, uh, don't give up this idea. And it was just an idea mm -hmm. back then. So I, I felt very inspired uh, and, I, and I tried to, to make it a, a project. Uh, thanks to, to my co-founders, which I met, uh, mm -hmm. 
a little bit after that, I, I, I was able to, to establish Hexagro as a for benefit company. So I have a question that I guess a lot of our attendees um, are interested in urban agriculture, maybe have already their own startups. Um, what would you say were the biggest obstacles that you faced during uh, this uh, process of building up your own company? And so, yeah, the biggest challenges you would say that people should be aware of um, next to these opportunities with the COVID-19 crisis. <laughs> Sure. Well, uh, you know, before the crisis, uh, startups uh, were already in crisis. We are always <laughs> in crisis. So uh, crisis is not a, um, a new thing for, for us. And I think that now we are showing how really we can be a resilient uh, organism, let's say. And I think that we startups can show how can we adapt to the change in markets because we can change a business model from one day to another. You know, we can uh, remote work from one day to another. So I think um, startups have a very good advantage, but they also face big, big um, challenges. For us, funding is always a challenge. Yeah. And in this period of time, a lot of investors are quitting out uh, deals, not only them, but also banks. Uh, sources of funding for early projects are going to other more urgent matters according to of course the eyes of the government so now a lot of uh, funds that were first destined to innovation are going to help existing companies you know to keep up um, things uh, well you know the activities so my recommendation for startups uh, and what we are trying to do is to uh, adapt, to change, to uh, kind of predict the different scenarios that will uh, happen after this crisis because there's, things are not going back to as they were before. Things are going to change from now on and I think we have to start by accepting that. So look at trends, look at studies, uh, think about how things might change in the future, secure your funding, reduce the, any costs that you have, keep your team together, be resilient, and don't stop fighting, don't stop pushing, because there will be so many opportunities in the future, new opportunities, that uh, it's not the time to give up great ideas. Exactly, yeah. And especially that uh, the COVID-19 crisis is often um, read in articles as a health crisis, but it's much more than that. It's also an economical crisis, uh, different degree according to countries, and it's a social crisis because of this economical crisis. And uh, it's an ecological crisis. We hear a lot of good news about the improvement of uh, air quality. And um, yeah, so wildlife uh, going back out and these kind of things. But uh, experts really worry about the rebound effect that, um, yes, yeah, things are, are getting better now, but when activities will restart and you will have huge investments to restart the economy, then we will have peak of pollutions and it's a real risk um, during the after COVID-19. So I think it's really the, the right moment for, for everyone who is like uh, involved in environmental initiatives to to get together and to prepare plans for the after COVID-19 because we need really a lot of new solutions and, and plans for that. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I, I think that what we're living today is just a taste, a little taste of what's going to be the long-term crisis of uh, global warming. Yeah. Because supply chains are being affected uh, the markets, uh, the economy, our model, which is based on exploiting the earth is, is failing. And this is good because the, the fastest we can change, the better it will be. So um, I think that uh, you're completely right here in Italy, we're seeing a situation which is unbelievable. It even got political now um, because as you know, there are a lot of migrants that are working in the fields uh, harvesting cherry tomato well tomatoes and you know 
all of these things. Uh, and now there are around 600,000 people uh, with uh, problems to get uh, money that are illegal, let's say, that are not normalized. And there is a whole political debate about what are the measures that the government should take because if there's no people you know to harvest what are like what are the companies going to do a lot of farmers are worried that their produce might get rotten it has happened already a lot of perishable uh, products are like being wasted completely and uh, other other uh, food like uh, spices and uh, things that are canned are actually spiking up. Uh, so there, there are like very weird effects that we are just going to notice uh, later on, like talking about urban agriculture. Uh, yeah. I have seen the other day that uh, Google Trends is saying that they are seeing a, a, a race in, uh, no, a pike in the searches for how to raise chickens. <laughs> so people are thinking about raising chickens and, and the, the seed sellers are completely out of stock. Actually, the sales jump about 12,000%, something completely unbelievable. They are completely out of stock. Um, and as I told you, uh, these uh, indoor farming systems uh, of small, small scale. So I think um, we will see a lot of, a lot of change um in the wood way and unfortunately also in the bad way yeah you were talking about food waste just now so a lot of uh, uh food were wasted during the, the crisis because it couldn't be distributed to to consumers uh it brings up the idea of a circular economy so how can we um integrate better uh, circular processes into the city uh how would you uh, connect this with urban agriculture? Uh, how do you see it uh, as an opportunity also to, to connect the two concepts? Well, I think, yeah, I, it's an interesting question because I think that circularity is also following principles of what is available locally. And I think that this comes together with consumer preferences. So I think we should really uh, try to uh, avoid buying uh, so many products that come from so long and far away uh, places. Um, I think uh, the principles of circularity are important in this crisis because uh, from waste, you can produce something new instead of uh, trash. So definitely um, models as using one industry's waste to produce a, another good are, are very important. And in Europe, the European Union is now um, developing a lot of regulations about new products that have to follow the principles of circular economy. Our products in Hexagro are uh, developed in a way that uh, you can replace or update any component individually so that your product will never perish. For example, we update uh, sensors or lights or the farming trays and, and you can just unplug the old ones, put the new ones. The old ones are going to be recycled and the rest of your system is there. So with this kind of approaches, you are going to avoid um, waste uh, in, in material, in energy, and well, I think all of these uh, kind of systems can be very beneficial when supply chains fall down, because in our case uh, that we produce uh, and develop hardware, we are also facing problems of not being able to receive components, not being able to, you know, uh, import parts and so on. So I think uh, if we will find a way to, to decentralize also our manufacturing, we will really reach the, the full circularity. And it comes to the topic of 3D printing. Exactly. <laughs> Consider 3D printing your farming modules, maybe to some point. We, we already open source. print some parts. Yeah, we already print some parts, but the technology is not yet there 
to allow uh, the economics to completely make sense, but that's the future. So yes, what we are planning in the future is to 3D print our systems. Nice, nice. Um, I think we can maybe open to the, our amazing panelists that are from everywhere in the world, <laughs> almost. Uh, I'm going to look at uh, who have raised their hands, who is interested in uh, bringing some more input. We have Lisanne from the Netherlands, Johanga from Australia, Henry from US, but who is based in Oman right now, and Ricardo in the UK. So if you would like to add something to this conversation, Maybe tell us how uh, the COVID-19 crisis um, impacted your, your, your business uh, in, uh, in urban agriculture and uh, how you adapt to it. That would be, I think, really interesting. Yeah, Lisanne? Yeah, I guess I can start. Um, so hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Lisanne. I am um, working as an, agrom an agronomist. Uh, specifically focusing on vertical farming. Um, I've worked for about one half year in a very large production farm and since recently I've uh, changed my job this month. And now I specifically work on vertical farming in a research center uh, that's an agro-consultancy company called Delphi. Um, so I'm a bit experienced growing crops on a commercial level. And um, my, I would like how to um, actually linked to what you were saying that you were investigating uh, the food crisis in Rotterdam um, because at, and before you were talking about how if Philippe for example was experiencing some more tendencies uh, for collaboration um, and so what I see in the Dutch vertical farming landscape is that there's actually a lot of initiative uh, for collaboration and there's several projects um, that are combining both educational institutions, research institutions, and commercial companies, both small and large scale vertical farms, that try to share knowledge um, and become a knowledge center um, uh, and to gain and bring all that information together. And the funny thing is that actually uh, the Rotterdam area, or it's a bit west of Rotterdam, the Westland, which is known as the high production uh, agricultural area, is the center of all this. So that it's, it's, it links to, to what you read lately yeah, about the Second World War. Now we see that there is, a, there is this collaboration happening. Um, and what I completely can agree on with uh, what Filippo was saying is that I indeed also notice a huge increase in interest um, both from clients and from people generally interested in the concept of indoor growing, specifically because it's so crisis um, independent in a way. And if you can produce locally, you really do not depend on um, those supply chains that currently are uh, struggling. And so in my day-to-day -day work, honestly, I feel I've noticed very, fairly little from Corona. Um, regarding my job, because being in the food industry, um, work continued with one and a half meter distance and production had to keep going and uh, things haven't really changed except the demand, let's say. So, yeah, that's my experience. And, and when you say that people are getting more and more interested in uh, urban agriculture initiatives, you mean people that are already in the food industry or also what type of person like yeah so it's a it's broad it's a broad interest but uh my given that i'm in the westland area there's also yeah. quite some interest from from the horticulture sector of course uh which are already working with ag tech um but just generally the request for information has increased um yeah nice thanks Thanks for your contribution, Lisanne. Uh, I think Henry wanted to go next. So Henry. Hi everyone, this is Henry Gordon-Smith, founder and CEO of Agritecture. I am a Corona refugee in Muscat, Oman right now. <laughs> I've been here since March 14th. 
So I just want to add to the amazing uh, content that Felipe and Meva gave. Um, so agriculture consulting, we basically help entrepreneurs plan and design and implement urban farms all around the world, 26 countries to date. But let me give you some updates on what's been happening. I think the first thing related to what Meva said is, you know, it's really interesting, this idea that a crisis like a world war or COVID-19 stimulates this interest in local agriculture and growing food at home. But just as Mavis said, it's very, very important that those foundations of community building, of best practice sharing, of education remain. And also that the society values that product as something that protects us, keeps us resilient, and also values that local economy. And so we have to really make sure we learn from those lessons. The problem is, is that urban agriculture and the cultivation of food is something that takes time, right? Lisanne will tell you all about it. It's not easy. It's, it's just something that requires a specific profile of person to actually be able to manage and learn how to do it. And in our short attention society, uh, most of us are actually not really well equipped to be gardeners. We have to kind of unlearn the short attention span that we've created through our cell phones and TV and, and just having access to whatever we want, whether it's strawberries in winter time or a movie that starts in three seconds on our phone. So we have to really shift our mindset completely and that takes time, that takes real investment, that takes real leadership across the board from community members to politicians to great organizations like Thought for Food. So that kind of goes into a little bit of what Felipe was talking about. So now we have this crisis or this increased demand. And so that's really exciting. And I'm gonna give you some data on that. I spoke to three different hydroponic equipment providers in North America. And right after the crisis, they actually saw 40%, some of them 200% increase in demand for ordering hydroponic equipment. So people are actually buying more um, and, and making those decisions in, in this crisis. So it's, it's creating real economic value, but will they maintain it or will those equipment pieces become kind of just junk in their garage or in their garden? That's the education piece, that's the support piece that's really missing. Um, some other data points is Agriculture Designer just launched our online farm planning software three weeks ago, right? So when the COVID-19 crisis was going. And so we've had a really um, interesting past four weeks of users trying it. We've had some really good feedback on it. But we actually have some data now from the whatever, I think 800 people already that have signed up. So we've got about, from that data, we, we showed that most of the users were from the US, about 40%, but it is actually spread out more globally than we expected. And we also saw that the vast majority of users had a budget under 25,000. So they get to submit what they want for their budget. So under 25,000, you can't really start a commercial farm, right? You're, you're gonna, it's gonna be very difficult to do that, especially with high tech equipment. So it lends itself to a lot of the category that Felipe is trying to target uh, with that new um, equipment. And so I think it really shows that there's a lot of people that are actually willing to spend some of their own money, more than just something on their desk, really talking about a garden that can provide some experience and some value and impact on what's, what, what's available on their plate in a time of crisis like this. So it's an interesting area to start to focus on from that. Um, just on COVID-19, our consulting business, we saw an enormous drop in our bigger deals. Our larger deals were paused, they were reduced. It's definitely been a bit of a challenge for our organization. But then two weeks later, we saw a huge uptick from countries that are creating incentives and responses from it. So, you know, six of our eight current clients are in the GCC in the Middle East. And so that's because the Middle East has actually really, they've they already been focusing on their food supply chain and, and, and protecting it. But this has really showed them the vulnerabilities in a dramatic way that they're starting to incentivize it. And the entrepreneurs in the region are saying, well, I need to do this. And they're coming to agriculture to do that. So that's great. So those are some interesting data points, I think, really connect to the, the main um, points that Meva and Felipe both made. So I hope that's helpful and interesting. Thank you, Henry, for your contribution. Data is super important, especially right now. We hear uh, everyone is an uh, expert in, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the crisis, in health crisis and so on. So uh, I like the fact that you brought some data to the conversation. Um, since you're an expert uh, in uh, urban indoor farms, I was seeing like a, a question in the chat from uh, Karim that says, how can urban indoor farms compete with diverse urban projects? So that's, that's a big question, right? Like you, you live in New York City normally, and uh, there's the need of, a, of a residential housing, right? So how can you compete with uh, space, use of space in the city? Yeah, it's extremely difficult. Um, I don't think that in a city that is actually growing, so if you look at a city that's declining like Detroit, um, but if you look at a city that's growing like New York, uh, you can't compete. 
with commercial or residential real estate. It's impossible with agriculture. Um, I think that there's certain markets where you can compete in an industrial area of the, of the community with large scale vertical farms. But even then you see in New York City, most of the vertical farms are moving towards New Jersey, which is an area that has industrial spaces, but is in decline as kind of manufacturing jobs that were very prevalent in that area moved offshore to places like China and other parts of the world that are lower cost in labor. So there's kind of infrastructure for industry, but there's not the jobs that are needed, but there's the talent that actually knows how to do those manufacturing jobs. So vertical farming kind of fit into those. And especially in the United States, there's a lot of economic development incentives called opportunity zones for these areas to develop them that vertical farming fits within that. But if we're talking about Manhattan, no way. You have to find what we call lazy spaces or useless spaces and make them productive again. And, and you know, overall across New York City, you've got about five acres of vacant spaces and rooftop spaces. So you know, if every person needs an acre to feed their entire diet, um, you know, that's, that's not a lot of um, space. Sorry, 5,000 acres. I apologize. Not, not, not five. 5,000 acres across New York City. So that's 10,000 people that are going to get all their food all the time, um, probably at a very high price. So, you know, you're not really looking at New York City. I mean, there's some exciting models. One of our clients, um, Aqua Arc, is actually developing a four acre greenhouse that's floating off of Bronx in the United, in, in, which is the largest food distribution hub in Bronx, New York. So that's an interesting model to say, well, how can we actually create land in the urban area uh, without taking up valuable space? And so, so there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. But even as floating farms start to develop and become popular, I'm sure that floating affordable housing is gonna to start to compete with it. Thanks, that was really insightful. Uh, I would like to maybe hear from also our other panelists, uh, Ricardo, Johanga. Would you like to add something? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, it's uh, kind of a half addition, half question. And maybe not that much uh, related to, to the situation right, right now with, with coronavirus, but um, I, I can see that uh, many, many of us are immigrants or expats, whatever label you want to, to use. Um, and uh, one of the things that bother me while living in the, in, 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 in the UK, it's, uh, and that's something that I miss, it's all the, all the local food that I, that I would have uh, back in, in Mexico, my, my, my home country. Um, and uh, something uh, um, that uh, I, I see an, an, an opportunity, especially in, in places like in the, in the Gulf countries with, with a lot of um, immigration uh, or, yeah, or, or in, in, in London or, or New York, all these, all these massive hubs, um, like people trying to grow the, their, own, their, the, the, their own food. Because of, of course, if I, if I get food imported from, from elsewhere, from a, from a tropical country, um, the, the cost is, is very high. On the, on the other hand, how, how, how much is this uh, really um, sustainable? Because if you want to grow a tropical crop in the north, you will need resources that are uh, well, a lot of energy or a lot of water that may not be available. So is, is, uh, how, how do you think this, this can move forward? I think this is maybe a question for Felipe. <laughs> so uh, just let me rephrase your question. You were asking uh, in simple words, how to move production from uh, a certain type of production from one region to another? Yeah. Well, uh, I think this is something that indoor farming allows. Um, I think that you cannot grow everything, of course, Unfortunately, you cannot grow an avocado tree. Well, probably you can, but I think it's going to be <laughs> making a lot of sense. Um, so definitely, there is a potential to grow food uh, that is not originally from that, from a, from a specific region. Actually, climate change is going to shift what we are able to grow as well. So uh, we will have to learn how to become resilient also in what we are able to produce uh, in the um, external environment. Uh, for example, here in Italy, they grow corn and avocados, and I had no idea about that before I came. So I, I think this is a consequence of how the climate has also changed over time and how the uh, 
market demands are pulling also for this effort to be made. So as you were saying, uh, how to get uh, strawberries in winter. This is something that indoor agriculture uh, makes possible. But as I mentioned, not everything can be done like that. So there is definitely a limit of uh, things that can be produced with technology. And I think that uh, the potential in the industry is actually unlocking those things that cannot be produced uh, locally. And probably <clears throat> we will have to learn as consumers to not buy avocados as before, um, because they, first of all, they have a, a, a high price. And second, they have a very large impact on the environment because of the of how they are grown and how energy is is used for bringing them to us so if if you are like me you know an immigrant and you miss the the food of your country well i think that we should make the effort of getting used to the local food and maybe try you know with these technologies that can allow us to to have our you know, um, peppers and, and other things that, that we like to eat back home. Yeah, I also think that there's like a big potential for pharmaceutical products uh, that can be grown in indoor farming. So things that maybe not growing in the Netherlands, but in some other part of the world, then you can just grow it on the top of your roof. Um, yeah, so that could be also an interesting alternative, I believe. I yeah. think that's a, a really good one as well. I think, you know, urban farming has to evolve beyond the food products. Those added value products are actually really appealing. Um, I was contacted by a group that's looking to use tomatoes to grow them hydroponically using, you know, very efficient methods with water and convert that into the lycopene for various um, cosmetic products that help you keep looking much younger than I do today. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm an early adopter. But anyway, um, so, so that's, that's exciting. And I think you know, one of our clients in Saudi Arabia is gonna be using controlled environment agriculture to grow some of the um, essential herbs and, or, or the herbs and medicinal products for essential oils to produce them locally. So if you think about a city like Medina, where there's a lot of tourism from the Arabic world, they come and they buy products. Some of them are historical that are based on the region that can't grow in the climate anymore because of a lack of water can't produce. So they actually come from other parts of the world, even though they used to grow there. With CEA, there are ways to grow them locally. And actually what we found is you can actually increase the convertible biomass, the usable content. Um, so it actually can in improve the amount of essential oils you can extract from the products. So there's actually ways that by controlling the environment, just like we can with a lettuce plant, which Lizanne knows a lot about, we can improve yield, color, texture, you can actually um, really improve other parts of the plant that can improve the product quality for the consumer. So I think that's also an interesting part of this resilience and, and what could be grown in these systems. I also wanted to add, for example, that there is a lot of advancements in genetics nowadays that allow you to grow uh, crops that are not uh, meant for the, for the weather that you are, for example. And they also allow us to engineer plants to adapt to the new uh, weather conditions and to make the use of resources such as water and fertilizers and pesticides more um, efficient. So uh, there are a lot of things that technology can allow us to do to, to become uh, more resilient for sure. And Philippe, I'd like to uh, link to that as well when you say that there's a lot to win with varieties and genetics. On the other hand, there's also a huge amount of energy savings to win on the technology aspect and you see especially in lighting that the steps so go so quickly with tens of percents um, every year that you can save on buying more efficient lights so i do think that there's huge potential to do start growing exotic crops all over the world in such a controlled environment because as soon as those varieties uh, become more interesting lights become more efficient you can bring up this balance and move away from only the very high productive leafy greens that are now mostly grown and move into the soft fruits tomatoes cucumbers and all those kind of crops that currently are still not within reach to be um, commercially interested but probably will be in the future 
Yeah, I think something that we do in Hexagro and we really are trying to get better at it is the fact that we have so much space in cities and that space is indoors in the places in which we live, in the places in which we work and those places are already environmentally controlled. So what we're trying to do is to develop a system that can be accessible, that can leverage these kind of spaces and that can leverage people because in the end we are facing, uh, you know, shortages of workers uh, in the farms, in the fields, in the vertical farms, there, is, there are shortages of workers. Why not empowering our society so that communities can become the new generation of urban farmers? Um, that's more or less uh, the, the, the approach that we are that we're trying to, to take. Yeah, it's very nice what you say there. I didn't make that link yet, but your spaces are already environmentally controlled. And that makes it, of course, very efficient. You only have your lights um, using the energy. Smart. Yeah, exactly. So why to, why to equip uh, a space with lights if you can use the lights you use to grow food as the, as the illumination of the place? Um, yeah, hi guys, my name is Saranga, I'm from, I'm calling you from Melbourne, Australia. Um, Felipe, you mentioned an interesting point about, um, about cities and empowering all the people and uh, so I'm an, I'm an architect based here and I'm a founder of uh, early stage ag tech um, startup and um, one of the things we're focusing on is uh, the way cities are really the infrastructure and not in the form of the area, the landmass, but the people, um, the people are the resource. Um, and I, I was going through some data and the cost of the, 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 the cost of labor and the workforce that we're talking about here is one of the, the bigger costs in vertic even in vertical farming. Um, that's on top of the energy costs. So, in cities, we've got the benefit of people who are now awakening to the fact that our resilience in um, our resilience as a community, as and as a social structure, is it needs to be sustainable within that locality. It can't just be imported or exported freely um, in circumstances like this. Uh, so, coronavirus has been a great um, eye opener for for things like that. We we went through a stage of globalization where everything became uh, exportable, uh, cheaper. Um, there were points where uh, I'm pretty sure in Australia, we used to ship fresh produce to get it washed overseas and then shipped back. So there's, um, there's factors that don't add up and there's, there's few situations like this that occur in history where there's, um, it, it brings it to the forefront that things don't yet make sense and they should make sense. And when we look at all these technologies that are being developed, we're able to start uh, integrating more people, uh, making them more aware and conscious of what's possible locally. Um, and sometimes the technology is not so far away from doing, uh, achieving that for even the most novice of users. Thank you, Hyanga. Actually, I wanted to ask you what is a uh... What would be your vision for the future Melbourne, the future of cities uh, as an architect? How would you integrate better food into cities, into spatial planning? Yeah, well, uh, the thing with spatial planning and um, Karim mentioned this on the chat is it's highly dictated by, and Henry also spoke on this, is it's dictated by the, the cost of investment and um, this, this is something that I'm also coming to grips with. Uh, as an architect, we, we generally speak on the topic of design, um, but now as a, uh, as a founder of a startup, I need to balance that out with um, the cost of investment and the cost of land. And as we all know in cities, land is not cheap. Um, and, then, and that makes the cost of the opportunity uh, not simple. So, there's situations where you can find properties that can be developed. I mean, even with vertical farms, we save, uh, we save area and we have efficiency uh, 
in the three dimensions, but you still need a nominal amount of area for that volume of efficiency. And what we're looking at is what are the in-between spaces where this can work and how it can be balanced out against the social, uh, the social benefit, uh, as well as ecological benefit. It's not just the, it's not just the economic return on uh, producing product. There is a greater impact that all of us can achieve if we're thinking in broad enough terms. Um, and I, th I think the great thing about COVID is it sort of allowed us to take a step back from our basic uh, systems that have evolved with time and um, with the expansion of uh, industrialization through to all sorts of different cultures that once had uh, methods, uh, history, and strategy for growing particular foods and uh, according to their consumption. We're now able to look at that and think, uh, maybe there is a better way. And what is that better way? When we're suddenly free to do that, um, just in the same way we're able to, uh, we're more inclined to jump onto a Zoom web conference and talk to each other. People are now looking at these alternatives and that's what we're seeing with the data. Um, people are, there's a high uptake in, in what could be the possible future. Thanks. Uh, I like the fact that you pointed out that we have to work on in-between spaces. And I don't know if it's a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, like with the COVID-19 crisis, more and more people are working from home and there's a lot of space in offices right now. Uh, maybe on the long term, could we imagine reconverting using those spaces for farming or is it then too uh, utopic to say that? Um, I just wonder. Well, I think that there's um, a lot of challenges with taking indoor spaces and converting them into indoor farms. The efficiency yeah. that's needed to have an economic business case um, you know, often lends itself to building a new building. I think at the beginning, when we first imagined vertical farming, it was about converting warehouses, converting vacant spaces, parking right. lots into vertical farms. But as we've experimented with the technology, what we've seen is that actually it's, it's actually cheaper to build a new building. When you create the right insulation, when you create the right scale of zones, when you create the right harvesting and packing areas, you, you significantly reduce the labor costs and the HVAC costs, which are, are, are really affecting the bottom line for vertical farms. So with that said, there are unique models. I just don't think that they're super scalable, but I think that, that I, I certainly admire and encourage diversity of urban farming solutions in cities. There are unique models that could work. So if you look at parking spaces, they can be converted to sort of incubators of a lot of pilot urban farms mushroom production, endives, aquaculture, composting, all these various parts of a circular economy system, those can happen in parking garages. And even some vertical farms, let's say, you know, up to a thousand square meters could potentially happen in those areas. Um, but again, I think that <clears throat> once the businesses scale up, they're gonna need a different kind of facility. And even if you look at um, aero farms that did convert a vacant building before, they're, they're no longer doing that. Spread builds new buildings. These are, are kind of the trends on the, on the larger side. So an office space, actually our first client in agritecture, we had two first clients. One was a school and the other was Deloitte that had a, an unused building in Jordan that needed a feasibility study for two towers and they're still empty to this day. So that's like six years since they contacted us that they've been empty. So probably eight years, these giant towers in, in, in a, a, a capital remain empty. And so they couldn't figure out what to do with it through any of the feasibility studies. So they said, what if we did a vertical farm? And the logistics of moving product out of that building, which was very much like an office building, didn't make up for the benefit of that product. So, you know, maybe if agriculture, urban agriculture was subsidized the way the fossil fuel industry is, or the way that soybeans are, or the way that meat is, maybe it would be competitive. But if you're competing on the market, it simply doesn't work because of those increased HVAC costs and labor costs. So I think that maybe um, some areas could be converted to smaller scale systems. I think that you could have ag tech incubators where maybe people have a little bit more space to do tinkering and experimentation. Maker spaces with an ag tech focus could happen with these. But that's not gonna fill all the empty office spaces in midtown Manhattan right now. 
those spaces, um, if COVID-19 really changes the way we work, those spaces are gonna be pretty much useless for a while. Madison uh, Avenue will be, you know, mad boring. Yeah, and, and actually jumping new Henry, who just uh, answered the question. You have a question in the chat. Um, when starting a project and searching from the perfect location, what would be the different factors to take into account? So you partially answered with your answer, but could you? Yeah, I'll yeah. just do it briefly. Thank you so much for the question, Karim. Um, so, you know, one of the first things you need to ask is what your budget is. Do you have $100,000? Do you have a million dollars, $10 million? That's gonna really define the kind of scale that you're open to. And also if you're gonna sell wholesale, retail, direct to consumer, um, or some other variation or hybrid model. So that's one of the big decisions you have to make. But in a city, you have to look at, you know, things like shading and temperature and transportation. You have to look at access to utilities. Some spaces don't have the same access as other spaces. For example, if you're building a vertical farm, it, you actually don't just need um, energy demand, the, the amount of energy, but you actually need the, the consistency of the energy is important. And not all energy infrastructure has that. So you have to actually install additional infrastructure for those really big vertical farms. So, you know, you have to think like an architect when you're building a farm in the city. You have to really think about the social, economic, and also all these various typologies that you're interacting with. Another big one is your climate, right? You may think you wanna build a vertical farm, but actually in your city, you may actually have a climate that's good for soil-based agriculture, that you can build at a lower cost, have more diversity, and have actually different incentives from the city for managing rainwater or biodiversity or education. So you have to really consider those trade-offs. Um, not to plug it too much, but um, our software product guides you through those trade-offs and helps you make those decisions and even has certain things like a daily light integral uh, tool that you can use to actually think about how light is gonna affect your farming um, in your specific location. So take a look at that, design.agritecture.com. Thanks, Henry. So I think we're getting, uh, running out of time. So we're gonna close this session. I would like to thank uh, Felipe to present his project and uh, giving us his insight how his business is adapting to COVID-19 crisis and also all our panelists. Really, your contribution was so cool, so interesting. And uh, yeah, um, let's keep in touch and uh, go urban agriculture. <laughs> yeah, go urban agriculture. Thank you, Mava. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Thought for Food. This was great. Let's do this again. Thank you, everyone. I, I, I just missed a very interesting topic, which is policy. Nothing of this is going to be as rapid as we wish if we don't convince our policymakers, as Henry was saying, to make things easier for urban agriculture. So let's, let's also focus on how to solve policymaking issues. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, and to round that off, so again, as Mova said, a huge thank you and go urban agriculture. Um, but I just wanted to say as well, you know, we've covered such great topics and we've gone from kind of growing in a small system like Felipe's with Hexagrow into kind of a whole building with, with Lizanne and Henry to kind of whole like rethinking cities, uh, which is what Hiranga and I guess Henry as well touched on. Um, it's been really fascinating and for everybody watching we've also recorded the session it will be available on the digital labs with notes as well um, and if you have any questions you know feel free to reach out to Salt for Food um, you can find us on all your channels um, but yes thanks again everybody and I hope to see you soon in our next live session thanks guys thanks bye, bye.